Hello all you hardcores out there, how are you doing? It's Russ here from Porky's Corner. Today we're joined by Julian. How are you doing, Julian? Sunday. All good, mate. All nice right. long weekend. Yeah, yeah, it's been great, hasn't it? A lot been going off. Uh, obviously, the big talking point this week is silence from Matchroom. Uh, Joshua, silence. Um, people coming out at Woodwork explaining the scorecards and what they were said, uh, especially Spencer Oliver. What's your take on it all, Julian? As I always say, Russell, so I don't follow as much to this kind of aftermath as you guys do, because this is obviously what you do. This is your, your thing. I, I pick a few bits up and I, I sometimes jump on YouTube and you see bits of clickbait. I did hear Spencer Oliver on TalkSport this week. He was really defending his position. And I think the frustrating for me with, with anybody is, you know, you've got to own something, haven't you? Joshua's got to own his losses. Everybody around him, I've got to own it. And everybody around them, I've got to say, do you know what? I called it wrong. And he got well beat. But people just won't do that. Look, there's something about human nature where nobody will ever say they were wrong. So Spencer Oliver, you called AJ to win. I think it was six or seven rounds. You got it wrong. You said it was a close fight. You got it wrong. You said... Um, Joshua was out boxing the best boxer in the world. You got it wrong. Own it. And guess what? People will respect you a hell of a lot more. It's a little bit like, you know, myself. I thought that Josh Taylor would be way too much for Jack Catterall. I couldn't make an argument for Catterall whatsoever, um, giving Taylor a fight. And I got it wrong. As simple as that. Just say, I got it wrong. I never saw it coming. But they won't do that well because they're, ups they're scared of upsetting people or the delusional, or they actually don't know much about boxing. And I don't believe someone like Spencer Oliver doesn't know a lot about boxing. Well, he knows a lot about boxing. He does a really good breakdown, doesn't he, on Sky and that? Absolutely. He knows He knows the game inside and out. It was a, a real good fight. I always remember the fight. They were him and Nazip at one point. They were going to get at it, weren't they? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll always be open again. You know, Naz would have him out, not a problem. But it was a good fight. Yeah, It'd have, it'd have taken him apart, not no doubt about it. I mean, Spencer obviously had that unfortunate injury, but you know, it was kind of in oh, a right behind him. They want the Spencer Oliver, weren't they? Yeah, there was the hype behind him, but I guess Sky was in its in its kind of infancy then, bringing new fighters, domestic fighters through. Oliver was good, exciting young kid. He had that brilliant fight with Keith Mullins, um, but you know, I, my memory is not brilliant. But he did get obviously got injured, the poor guy, but he got well beaten, was it a European title fight? So when the European title meant something, if I've got the stats wrong, I'm sure someone will point that out. But yeah, it was good. But I think I think Naz was an absolute different level. All right. Uh, do you think Spencer might have shot his Senate foot, uh, boasting that he was the guy that started it all off with his KSI and YouTube boxing in the UK and all that? And he's put a few shows on like that. Do you think, is that like double dipping or wanting your cake and eating it? What do you think? I think it's shocking for a guy who has integrity, who's boxing through and through, who's a really good amateur and a, and a good pro and somebody who's respected in boxing to be promoting this kind of garbage anyway. I, I will be completely honest. I know there was some... Uh, was it professional or was it white collar? You're going to have to educate me on this one. Uh, Last one. The first KSI one, didn't they have one, a deal with Sky as well? One of them went on Sky, didn't it? I think the first one were white collar, wasn't it? I might already... Right, okay. Box and it went, and I think Eddie didn't Eddie Earn get involved in one of them and he made them all have a, a medical or something. It's all a bit smelly, in it? All that, in it? And I don't like all like that. It's not boxing, in my opinion. But listen, what can you do? It's uh, it's done, in it? It, but, it uh, makes money, and um, people will be trying to convince us that these guys, and I haven't seen the action, I just saw it again come up on, on YouTube. But, uh, there was no temptation to click on the highlights for last night's fights, if that's what you want to call them. Anybody wants to get in a ring and have a go, no issue with it whatsoever. I think what I probably have an issue with is guys who haven't paid their dues jumping straight in these YouTubes and making an absolute ton of money. Um, and then you've got fighters struggling up and down the country, having to sell tickets to a former national champions. It just sticks in my throat but this is this is life this isn't just boxing it's always the way it is but 
I mean, was it pay per view or something? I don't know. It was Daz on that one last night, wasn't it? I mean, yeah, I don't know if you have I've seen all, all the usual faces there hovering around like flies around a turd. Well, I, I cancelled the zone when there's nothing on I really want to watch. So Max actually sent me a screenshot of that this show. That's why I know it was happening, saying the zone, the zone advertising it or something. And I just says, well, they can get lost. So I just cancelled my zone subscription for August. I've just cancelled it. So if there's some real boxing on with some real fighters, I'll pay the eight or nine quid. But if that's what they're serving up, I've got no intention of watching it. If Spencer Oliver wants to be involved, then, I mean, why wouldn't Spencer Oliver want to be involved with, you know, really talented fighters or bring fighters to himself? What, just jump on the bandwagon. It's like, you, it's the demise of, listen, we have this conversation, I always get shot down when I say boxing's dead. Boxing's not dead. Boxing's buoyant for the, for the 1%. I've always said the same thing. Boxing's really struggling in, ter in terms of its integrity and purity and honesty for the for the rest of the 99%. And it's people like Spencer Oliver who are doing that by promoting these shows when these guys are headlining, making absolute tons of money. And as I've just said, these guys on Dennis's shows or Mark Bateson's shows treading mud just to just to keep going, to keep the dream alive and not getting opportunities and then getting disillusioned with boxing and packing in because they're, they're struggling to sell tickets, they're struggling to get opportunities, even for like local belts. And they pack in and they walk away from the sport. And then you sat at home, you've done 10 years in the amateurs, you've won three national titles and you're watching these jokers earning hundreds of thousands of pounds, if not millions. Is like, life's never been fair, but it does seem in boxing right now, it's, it's more unfair than anything. And I just think that the backslapping and, you know, the, the likes of Spencer Oliver, who I respect and, and I, I, I do respect, but just because I respect him doesn't mean I won't say what I think. I think it's cringeworthy. You've gone from cringeworthy last week, the the sycophantic um, bowing down to AJ to cringeworthy now, you know, placing yourself in the middle of these glorified white collar shows and it's embarrassing and you should be embarrassed. Yeah, I wonder if he's... Uh... If he's losing his head a little bit in awesome, or if it's all all this a bit of attention, and I wonder if he's not handling it very good because his behaviour seems bizarre, doesn't it? Yeah, there might be an element, and I would I would understand this with Spencer because there could be an element of Spencer Oliver that his career was cut short, and he would have had a good career. He would have been a a good fighter and made a lot of money. So I understand that, but you would think that the next best thing to do would be to I know he's done bits of training, but not really would be to really get involved and to maybe go down the coaching route, go down the management route, but do it properly, you'd think. But I guess somebody somewhere is pushing these buttons now, aren't there? And the, you know, the, the pulling the strings, telling these guys what to say and how to act and what to get involved in. And of course, if you want to legitimise something, like you want to legitimise YouTubers boxing and get people to pay for it, what better way of legitimising it by associating it with... Somebody who works at Sky. Somebody who works at Sky and, and somebody who was a hell of a fighter in his day and is generally a, one of the big faces in boxing. It's just by association. So. so are we saying, and I want people to leave comments in the comments section, has Spencer Oliver, a.k.a. Jug Ears, has he sold his soul? That's what, I'm, that's what I think he has, but it's up to decide, isn't it? 100%. I know it's a bad example, but I always use the analogy that everybody says, like, for example, all these numerous belts we've got in boxing and all these, you know, these white collar guys coming through and unlicensed, etc. And everybody says there's, a, there's enough there for everybody. It's good for boxing. It's good for boxing. It's not good for boxing's purity and integrity. And it's a little bit like um, if you're a building contractor and you're working on demolishing a hospital wing for cancer patients or for screening or something, you can argue, you can say, yeah, but it's good money and my lads are on double time and if, it, if we weren't doing this, but it might sound like a bad analogy, but in the long term, you're doing a bad thing. You're contributing to the demise of the NHS or to the, the demise of healthcare. Whereas in the long run, all these guys getting involved in these joke shows when real pros are walking away from the spot or kids are not interested and kids are going to the UFC, 
short term, you're making a few quid yourself, but long term, it all contributes to the the demise in the popularity and the demise in the integrity of boxing because the new consumer, the casuals and the YouTubers and the youths who do watch this kind of show, they've got no idea. They think they some of these people, I've seen the comments, think Jake Paul could beat Canelo. Some of these people truly believe KSI could go out there and be uh, a Callum Smith. They really believe that. So you effectively get in a sport that is incredibly skilled and incredibly detailed, and it takes a long, long time to learn and to hone. You basically say anyone can do it. Anyone can box now. Anyone can get a license with the Board of Controller in Europe. Anyone can take part. Anyone can be on TV. Anybody can be on Sky or the Zone. And you're making something that's incredibly skilled seem just like mediocre. And, and it, for me, it's demoralising boxers and boxing. Do you think that it'll all, be, it'll all come to an end if we have like a crossroads fight, you know, like a YouTuber and a boxer and somebody gets a... Do you think it touched what they don't? Do you think that's where it's heading? Well, I think the no one, no one, and this is how we started the show on about owning, owning being wrong. Even if that was the case and somebody, which we don't want anyone to get injured, but if someone does get injured or one of these guys, yeah. as you all say, a, a body on the slab because they're not fit to be in a professional boxing ring, ultimately people just walk away from it and say, it's nothing to do with me. Well, I, oh no, I, I wasn't anything to do with it. Nobody would take ownership for it anyway because if, there's a, if they can sniff a pound note around the corner from the next guy coming through, they'll do it because, listen, what... What is this? Boxing is the biggest slut in sport. You know, that's a, a phrase I heard from a, a really respected broadcaster and former world champions. Boxing is the biggest slut in sport. And boxing will do anything to make, make money, anything whatsoever. And they just don't care. They, they sadly don't care. And uh, maybe it's generational. Maybe, you know, the, the great fights that we used to watch, maybe they've gone forever and we just get a really good fight now and again and we have to be happy with that. Yeah. Uh, Usyk, Tyson Fury, is he retired? Is, is he not retired? We don't know. He's asking for 500 mil, but Usyk wants that fight. Uh, do you think that's a massive fight? I do. I think it's a huge fight. I don't think any purse split is going to be 500 million. I don't know if Tyson says things tongue in cheek because the one thing we know about Tyson, sometimes I don't think he's lying. Sometimes I don't think he's, you know, it's how he is. I think he just says things to be provocative, stay relevant, and just to wind people up. I think he's a wind up merchant. And we all know, I mean, as far as I know, the WBC belt's not being sent back over to, to Mexico right now. So, that's that's the, as far as I know. Will he fight Usyk? Likely. Will Tyson Fury fight again? Absolutely zero doubt about that. And will we all pay to watch him? Of course we will. So he's got us. Tyson's got us right there. He's loving it. He's laughing. I like it that he uh, gives them run around and promoters me. I love that. It keeps them guessing all the time. They've got no idea. Warren they? didn't come out and say anything. Normally, he's forcing and in normally with every fighter he has. You don't see that with Tyson, do you? He's on back foot all the time, isn't he? Nobody tells Tyson Fury, uh, you know, what to do. He's his own man. He, he really is a fighting man. But he's also under no illusions. And I won't swear because I'm going to keep... About what boxing out. is. No, no swearing. He's under no illusion about what boxing is and why people are interested in him because he's the best fighter in the world. And no one's really his friend. He's a family man. He's got kids, family. He's close to his dad and his brothers. And I think he just treats the majority of promoters and people in boxing with contempt. I agree with that. I think it's funny when he does that. I love how he calls Eddie Hearn out. I won't swear, but the things he said about Eddie Hearn, Eddie Hearn's not his cup of tea. Would Tyson Fury work with Eddie Hearn? If he could deliver 500 million, absolutely, 1,000%. But the one thing I will say about the Fury and Usyk fight, there's much more chance that the undisputed is going to happen now Eddie Hearn's got nothing to do with it. Yeah, because yeah, he's been the one that's been the problem on it, I think, all along. Yeah. Do you remember that, you know what leaves a bad taste in my mouth? And this is when I started to think, you know what? Eddie's not, not for me. You know, the Vladimir one... Uh, 
Joshua, and they flew Wilder over, didn't they? Paid him good money to come over, put him up, first class travel. Wilder thought he were next. They were saying he were next. And look what they did. They didn't go near him, did they? That were over five years ago. Just it's, all over for, it's all over for Joshua and Wilder, more or less now, isn't it? So we missed that fight, didn't we? Well, we missed the fight when both were unbeaten and destroyers, and we would have got a, a really good, exciting fight. Yeah. And even if we get that fight 12 months, 24 months down the line, you've got a fighter who's will be approaching 40 in a couple of years in Wilder, whose you know, best days will start to go be behind him. He's had two bad beatings, you know. Joshua's had three defeats now. So it saturates, it'll still be a massive fight, but what they, when they would have been fighting, when Fury was obviously in, in hibernation, they would have been fighting to say who's number one. Whereas if they were fighting now, well, would it even be an eliminator for a world title? They're, they're kind of out of the picture right now, aren't they? So it'd be a fun fight, but there's no relevance in the fight. Do you think that Eddie Hearn's going to come out and so when I say, oh, they're going to keep me out a few years here now, if we'll set Fury fight twice and then you've got mandatory. So Joshua's way out at scene. Do you think he'll just say it's not about belts now and just go on a tour with him or something? Nigeria, China, all that, Australia. It'll suit him down to the ground because uh, AJ is still massive globally, isn't it? You know, I'm sure the Saudis would still pay for AJ to have a big fight over there. And who knows if if Eddie will do that, but it'll certainly make him work, won't it? That contract was a big, big for contract. life. For life, isn't it? A match up promotional deal for life and does own five years. So if he fights, he's a match they're getting the cut, aren't they? He's tied down, isn't he? Yeah. I mean, it'd be interesting to see if he keeps to his word what he said. He says, you know, we're gonna like drop him back down half a level. He's had too much pressure with the stadium fights, but you've made him too big. He's not gonna to want to be on someone's undercard now or in a a 5,000 seat arena, you've made him that big now. So he's kind of become a self fulfilling prophecy what you've done with him. And now, whereas, you know, I've said before, my, my view would be drop him down and fight some top 20 guys and learn your craft. That's not going to happen. He'll be slaughtered now if he doesn't fight legitimate opposition. So he's, remember we were saying when he, when he beat Charles Martin, once you, you take what you thought was a cheap, quick belt, just because you were desperate to have your fingers on any portion of the heavyweight prize. As soon as you did that, you're up there. There's no dropping back down when you have a world title, you're up there. Um, that leaves a sour the, taste in your mouth, doesn't it, Julian, how they, how they did that, isn't it? You know, because they, they kept saying he's learning that job and all that, we can't fight him yet. I hate it because, yeah, you've, you've created a situation where you haven't allowed him to learn on the job, and then every time he has a bad fight, a bad performance or he gets beat, you continually say to us he's learning on the job. But what I will tell you, even though I think the development of boxers takes time, it doesn't take 10 years, and he's been pro 10 years. So if I had somebody working for me and 10 years later they still couldn't do the job, they wouldn't be working for me. So is he really learning on the job now? You know, how, how long are we going to continue to say he's learning on the job? You know, he had 49 amateur fights. Larry Holmes only had 25 amateur fights. How long are you going to keep saying this for? Yeah. Uh, Eddie says he's going to get him out four times at next year. I think that's too much for him. Okay, I'll make it. And, I, and I, this is on your show. Happy to do it, right? And this will be for a charity. Um, I, I'll give to charity anyway, but, you know, my, my son has autism, as you know. And, yeah, if AJ fights four times next year, I'll give £500 to charity. And I'll give you proof of that. I, get, I'll get, I, I, I do stuff for charity anyway. I'm not going to talk about that. That's a vulgar thing when people do that. But I'll, 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 I'll put it in pot if he fights four times before end of next year, yeah? yeah I'd be surprised if he did because he's not been an active fighter, has he? And there's too much going on in it for him to be concentrating on four camps. It's too big. They'd just be flogging him, wouldn't it? They'd just be flogging him if they did that, wouldn't they? It's way too big. He just couldn't do it. Um, I don't mean to be vulgar talking about charities, by the way, but is is he couldn't do it? They couldn't organise it. They couldn't cope with camps. You know, even though we know that you know Harry Greb fought forty three times a year, and that's very unusual. And I think Nigel Ben and Mike Tyson, when they were learning and knocking guys over, they're like 10, 11, 12 fights in a twelve month period, which was unbelievable. But I was also, like, I like to watch Ray Leonard. I was watching Ray Leonard Benitez um, recently from 1979. And the commentator said, when Leonard fought Benitez, he goes, 
this is Ray Leonard's ninth fight this year. Can you imagine that? An Olympic gold medalist, and he was in his ninth fight that year. It could, it could happen then. It just doesn't happen now, mate. There's no way it happens. Um, and they've created this, haven't they? Because everything has to be a stadium fight. They've got gap fighters under contract who will, won't get out of bed for less than 10 million. They've created this. So they can't lose money. So they have to make big events. There is no way Anthony Joshua is going to fight four times next year. Not a chance. No, no I, I don't think that. I hope I'm wrong, by the way. Who do you think his opponent will be, Julian? Well, it'll be somebody outside the top six or seven. It'll be somebody who's not affiliated to another. Well, Dylan White got slipped in at number 10 this morning, according to Kent. Well, you the see, you, you and Kent said this, you've got to watch the rankings, haven't you? Because I'm yeah, sure you've got to watch the rankings for these fighters to just pop up. That's not the first thing I think of when I got up in the morning. It's usually an express though. But Kent's like, I've just woke up. Rankins. <laughs> Ken's prolific, isn't it? He's such a he, he, he Ken. I've I watch Ken. I love him. I think he's brilliant, and I listen to him sometimes. He'll tell you in 1994 who the number six IBF cruiserweight was, and it's like, how how do you even remember this stuff? It's like it's impressive stuff. To be fair, um, I can't remember what I had for breakfast. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. I can't the, watch the rankings. Let's see how it all pans out. Um, but he's never going to be good enough to be undisputed. We know that. And if he's happy with, at some point, picking up a, an interim belt or a regular belt to try and then talk about unifying, you know, again, good, good luck to them. But I'll tell you what you will, I think you will see. In, it might not happen next year. I think 18 months' time, they'll fall out. Him and this, this, these brothers and family and Eddie and AJ will fall out. There's no doubt about it. He'll be ready to court them. He'll want rid of him in end, but if he's tied to him for life, that's yeah, it. it's like they, all, they always fall out, and it's all always over money. And listen, AJ's he could have said no. But we said at the time, apart from thirty-five million. It was not in Joshua's best interest taking that rematch. Activating that rematch clause was just, it was a nonsense. You know, when I mentioned it the other day in a video, I said that maybe they should have, that belt that Usyk were mandatory for, they maybe should have just gave that up and got Matt down the line, do you think? It was too risky for him, wasn't it? But we, we yeah. applauded him for taking it, though, didn't we? But I know they were nervous because he went to watch him fight Chisora, didn't he? But that he took he took confidence from that because everybody were gassing uh, Derek's performance up, weren't they, and dissing Usyk. But Usyk's a wily old fox, and they're not daft them, like, are they? Well, Usyk first of all was getting a, adjusting to heavyweight and the different the, the way that presents itself. I also thought Usyk beat Chisora easy. Anybody who thinks you know Chisora was in that fight again, but scoring people missing and ineffective aggression. Yeah. And the one thing that Anthony Joshua can't do, that Derek Chisora can do, he can't apply that constant pressure. No. He, he, he has to do it in, in bursts, which is what we saw again last week. You know, we were working short increments within that fight. He had his massive burst in the ninth round, which I thought it hurt Usyk. And then I watched it again, you know, a week after. I always watch the fight a couple of times a week after. And... At no point was, was, was Usyk really hurt in that ninth round. It looked like he was. The crowd sounded like he was. The forward-backwards motion made it look like, again, aesthetically like he was, but it really wasn't. And he, yeah. you could see it. He watched every single shot come in. He blocked, block, roll, caught a couple, diffused the situation, and then he just put... A lot of punches were going there, weren't they? There, weren't they? Really weren't, they weren't landing, and it, it looked... A lot more concerning than it actually was, and some sometimes people doing real things doing real time, don't you? You watch a fight the day after, and you go, "You hurt him, you know." I think you knocked him down, and then you watch it back, and you're like, "Well, actually, it wasn't that big a deal." Mm. Would you, how would you think Usa could do against, say, Dylan White, Wilder? Oh, it it beat me easy. Beat Dylan White easy. What about Wilder, I think he'd be too clever for Wilder. Um, obviously the the pet, you know, the Wilder connects and it's all over, but it's not going to happen. I mean, 
Wilder would struggle with not the there southpaw. to be it is the Usak, is he really? He's just not there. And Wilder really struggled with it. Um, the Polish kid who was a southpaw, whose name escapes me, and he struggled with Ortiz. Ortiz is a good fighter, but he was old. But whenever Wilder's fought what I would call conventional southpaws, not tricky southpaws, just conventional mm-hmm. left handers, he's not got them out of there quick and he's struggled massively. So fighting, fighting Usyk, he'd just be like, He'd have a nightmare with him, and I think he'd get beat. He'd probably get stopped. Yeah. Tell us a funny story, Julian, in boxing. Oh, funny stories. God. I, I won't, I won't tell you what Steve Ray told me. I'll tell you offline, mate. But I, I, have, I have a story about, about Gary Sykes. I'm allowed to mention him, but just Sykes was just a nightmare. You know, it was just like, it was funny to me after. It might not be funny to your listeners and I'm no comedian, so forgive me. So when, when Sykes was coming through the rankings and people were saying, you know, you're training, you were a relatively inexperienced pro coach in Jules, you know, maybe need a bit more experience. I'm trying to also like assert my position and, you know, but, you know, get, get out there and prove myself to my peers, really. That was when I was wet behind the ears. So Sykes had already, um, I think it was about 6 and 0, 7 and 0, and we were fighting on a Sky show. And Gary was absolutely just useless. He used to forget everything. So it was, it was an eight-rounder. I think it was Ibra Arias. I, f- I forget the name. And there were big names there. There was always big names at the Maloney shows back then. You'd get David, David Price. You'd get, you know, Bellew and all those guys were there. And Adam Booth was a coach who I sort of looked up to. And I just thought, I'd just be just great to work alongside these coaches and to be, be around the good fighters. So we got to the show and Sykes weighed in. And I think Gary was on fifth. And Gary being Gary, starts to get changed and he goes, oh, Jules, I forgot my boots. And I'm like, you what? He goes, I forgot my boxing boots. It was just absolutely just useless. And I says, no, Gary, tell me that you haven't. Tell me that you haven't. He goes, I forgot my boxing boots. He says, he's like, I don't know what to do. We're too far away. I can't remember where the show was. It was too far away. And I'm like... I don't believe this. So we're having me, myself, and uh, a fighter's dad who is training his son, Tony Aitchison. We were asking around if any of the boxers had got a similar size boxing boots to Gary or if anybody had turned up and brought the boots, but they weren't boxing. So I'm like cringing now, thinking I don't believe this. So Gary was on fifth, and the guy who was on third, he had the similar size feet to Sykes. And Tony had arranged with this guy, he said, I'll as soon as you get out of the ring, I'm going to take your boots off you. And I'm bollocking Sykes like you do. And Adam Booth sat down and there's David Price. And they, yeah, and they're in the changing rooms and he was with George Groves. And I'm just like thinking, I'm just thinking, well, I hope he hasn't seen this and because he's just going to think, what a clown, you haven't even checked your boxer's boots. It's a schoolboy error. So the guy who's, Gary's, Gary was going to use his boots. See, Sykes was a nine, this guy was about 11. That was the closest we could get. So he got stopped and he had to see the doctor and he was getting stitched in the dressing room. And he was sat on a table getting stitched and Tony H was like pulling his boots off, off this kid who was like disorientated and didn't even know where he was. And I were warming Sykes up and I'm warming him up on the pads and he had his socks on. And there was just this moment where Adam Booth was just watching me. And I'm warming Sykes up and I just looked at Adam Booth and he looked at me and he went, just like that. And I was absolutely gutted, mate. It was just like, afterwards, I gave it to Gary. I said, you've shown me up. I can't believe it. I says, I'm there with what now are my peers, you know, these like coaches who I really kind of look up to. I said, and you're warming up in your white towel in socks. And I was just absolutely gutted, mate. Sykes you get some boots in the end. Oh, I was, I was just gutted, mate. You get some so boots got, in the end, though, yeah? Yeah, he got, the, he got the boots about five minutes before he boxed. And they just, he put in a shift, you know, he beat, he beat this kid easy, but it was just like uh, the stuff stuff Sykes used to do, mate, it's just unbelievable. It was always doing these like stupid stuff. But I used to learn then and say, boots, socks, gum shield, two gum shields, guard, da 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 da. Good night, mate. Yeah, I'll Print. tell you a funny one. I'll tell you a funny one, I think. Peter Fury's 50th birthday party. Everybody had something to eat. It's just an old tally in Bolton. I didn't eat though, but I had a lot to drink. And anyway, uh, 
then he scalps microphone and I put, and I said to Steve Bonto, we meant Mick Ennis who there, pure was Savannah. Oh, Big Ron's gonna do a speech here. Big Ron likes to, you know, take hold of whatever he does, you know, if he's had a drink, if there's a microphone about. Get us on stage, didn't do a speech, did fly me to the moon by Sinatra. <laughs> it was any like, good. We were like, Russ is like a pro. <laughs> yeah, honestly. Oh, was it good? Really? Yeah, really shot spot. Where did that come from? That was funny. It brought house down, mate. Right at the end of the night, you know, everybody would tank up. Yeah. Good for him uh, for doing yeah, it. Yeah. Take some balls, that doesn't it? I've seen him do yeah. that a few times, but it's not like doing a bit of karaoke. I'll always do a little bit of karaoke. Yeah, they look great, that, but... don't they? His daughter's Dennis's daughter's been on that will uh what's that program man? You know where they, they turn around its seats and she had a manager, Will I Am. Oh, uh, the voice. The voice. She's been on that. Yeah, I know which one it is. Jessica Steele, she's called. Jessica Steele. Oh, well. Yeah, she's good. Yeah, she's good, but the so and Dennis's other daughter's a singer, isn't she? Or she's only about 10, I think, or 11. She's a I didn't know that, so I got a talented family then. Singers, aren't they? That's I think good. his dad used to do a bit as well with Sonata in pubs up in Burley and that. It's not only a bit of karaoke, is it? You listen, people used to, we used to say this to me, like, create memories. Just create, well, yeah, honestly, uh, create memories. I keep like saying I'm going to do it, but I've got no, I, I don't if I could, but first chance. Chelsea does it all remember. the time. Like I said, we've just come back from Florida. Me, me, me and Kelsey did karaoke in Irish bar. We're not, I'm, I'm not, I can't sing. Kelsey can sing a little bit. Who cares? You know what I mean? It's just like, don't take yourself too seriously, mate. Take yeah. yourself seriously when you're after, but don't take yourself too seriously. And, and don't take life too seriously either. Hmm. All right. Well, you want to go on to part two then, Julian, yeah? Yeah, why not, mate? So join us on part two. This will be even better. And then I'd turn it off.